Hello, everyone, and welcome for joining us today for another Conversations with Kesey. We hope that the students listening at a later day know that we also appreciate you setting aside time um, to hear Thomas speak to us today. Uh, we also want to know that this is a recorded event um, and will be, shared will be shared later on platforms, but we also encourage all um, participation from members. So please feel free um, in the Q&A portion at the end to either unmute yourself or ask a question in the chat um, for our student moderator to ask. I'd like to thank our guest, Thomas Farrakata, for coming and joining us today, and we appreciate it and look forward to hearing your insights. And lastly, I'd just like to introduce our student moderator for this afternoon, Adam Warner, who is a marketing intern in the Kesey office um, to kick off the conversation. So Adam, thank you, and I will turn it over to you. Awesome, all right, well, thank you, Beja. Um, yes, thanks, Thomas, for being here. So excited to, to talk to you. Um, so yeah, we can get started. So first, just tell me a bit more about Reapley. Uh, how were you guys founded and how did you end up in your current, current position? Yeah, th thank you. And, and thank you to the uh, QC team just for inviting me on. I, you know, I'm an IU graduate, so this is pretty cool for me to be able to talk to you guys. But uh, in, in short, I mean, Reapley is a technology company. We're based here in, in Chicago. Um, we got started in 2015. And really back then we kind of had this singular mission of how do we connect underserved labs with well-funded labs, right? And when it, came, when it came to resources. And so we, we didn't really have any kind of um, focus on the circular economy back then. This was, this was an opportunity to simply take resources that were going to waste in labs and connect people to use them, right? So to extend the life, the life cycle of those those important research resources, and this was happening kind of in the backdrop of a time period um, when we were facing. I mean, we still are facing budget cuts, but research in particular were facing budget cuts, um, and it made all the sense in the world to to try to extend the life of these resources. And so, you know, my my kind of first foray. Um, with with Reapley and, and with our, our founder Gary was was um, in 2015 when he called me. I was actually I was working for a integrated life science marketing agency. That's my background in, in life science marketing. And he told me this idea, and I said, "Well, that's crazy because I literally just heard you know a genomics company complaining about the waste of their um, of their NGS kits, right? These next gen sequencing kits, and they would they would throw out all these reagents and I just thought it was a brilliant idea. And so I made the decision to, to join um, a couple of years later. And at the time we had, we had one client, it was Northwestern University, which is where this idea um, uh, got started. And we were just trying to, to solve a singular problem related to surplus waste. And so um, fast forward to today, um, we are working more closely with organizations that are trying to better understand from a procurement uh, perspective how to make better purchasing decisions based on items that are already available, right? So our mission at Reapley is to make the world's resources more discoverable, uh, transferable. So people, colleagues within an organization can share resources and then more valuable in our, our global economy. And so I run all the marketing. I, I do kind of all of like the event marketing and um, content marketing and making sure our, our story is being you know, kind of driven through that, but that's kind of how this this got uh, took took off essentially is, is in, a, in a more lab uh, format. Yeah, for sure. And you mentioned the circular economy, and you kind of have your own circular economy at Reapley in a way, um, just kind of always selling and exchanging assets that are already kind of in the market. Um, but could you explain a bit more about like the idea of a circular economy and kind of what benefits come from it? Yeah, I, I wish I had like two hours <laughs> to like actually go go into the, the ins and outs. But I think in, really to define the circular economy, you have to be uh, aware or understanding of what's wrong with our current economy, right? Our linear economy. And since the industrial revolution, innovation has always been tied to this, this sort of take, make and dispose model. So if you do research, if you, if you Google the circular economy, you're probably going to end up on some sort of you know, a, a story around the, the linear economy first. And really it makes sense, right? So like we've been taught when you need something, you buy something, right? That's just 
you, you buy something new, you, you want to create something where well, you're going to purchase it new, makes a lot of sense. The problem with with that is you're buying, from, typically you're buying from global supply sources, right? So like China owns 95% of the rare earth elements in our world and they have, they have a, a you know, dominance over that. And so when you're harvesting and extracting these materials, you need to be thinking of them as, as commodities. And that's really what the circular economy is about, right? So the circular economy, if you, it, the, the best way I like to describe it is to look to nature, right? In nature, you have kind of the, um, the nutrients, right? Of, of like a tree will fall down in the forest and it'll give back to the, to the soil, right? Or maybe it's a home for animals. Um, and so similar to that, we are trying to mimic nature for our man-made resources, right? So like the nutrients of a product are designed and optimized for this cycle of disassembly and, and reuse. And so the way we think about the circular economy at Reapley is obviously from the context of technology, right? How, do you, how can technology scale that? But it's really, even simpler than that, it's it's this idea of the tighter the the research uh, the kind of the the resource uh, sharing circle, the faster an item will return to use. And right? it makes it, Facebook Marketplace does this uh, next door. If you ever use the mark, I use it in my my neighborhood every now and then. But like businesses don't do that, right? They just they buy and they buy again, and you have procurement managers that aren't connected to sustainability managers across campuses or across different locations. And so you really need to be thinking about the most uh, most likely path for, for reuse um, and the players locally who can use these um, these leftover materials. And so that's that's kind of our our mindset. But the circular economy has taken off, especially this year, because we're seeing we, we got an unfortunate peak inside what a broken global supply chain looks like. We know what that looks like with COVID. It's a, it's a disaster. I mean, how many of you had issues getting resources sent, you know, to your house? It's, it's been a, it's been a, uh, a struggle and organizations are now starting to talk about these things and saying, okay, how do we get more value out of what we're sitting on? Yeah, for sure. And I remember when we went to your office in Chicago, one of the things we talked about, and that really struck me kind of initially about hearing what you guys do was the potential for sustainability. Um, and just kind of having less like new resources and kind of reusing ones that are still just as good. Uh, so was that kind of sustainable impact part of the Reapley mission from its founding? Or like, was that not on your radar when you uh, started working on this? No, I, th I think it was on our, our radar. I mean, Honestly, when you think about Reapley, you, you're trying to align these kind of like global production and consumption systems with sustainability and ESG goals, right? So like, we just wanted to solve the problem of don't double buy. <laughs> it's pretty simple. Don't double buy. And then when you, when you choose not to double buy, what you're essentially, what you're doing in, in, in effect is creating opportunities to create a, a, a greenhouse gas emissions from a supply chain perspective, right? A lot of people, you know, when you think of uh, sustainability, you run to material uh, makeup, right? I want to buy something that is made up of X material because it's eco-friendly or something. But rarely do you hear people talking about uh, systems change, uh, 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 system approaches to sustainability and the supply chain emissions kind of side of it. And so I guess to illuminate that a little bit, there's this elephant in the room with businesses where they're throwing away $630 billion worth of resources every single year. And so to put that in perspective, that's, that's you know, higher than uh, something like 175 countries, the GDP of 175 countries, it's an astronomically high number. Um, and yet we're talking about material efficiency, which is good. I'm not saying those are bad things. It's just that the conversation needs to be shifted to, to the, this kind of systems approach when it comes to um, sustainability. And so, you know, even if we were to shift to all renewable energy, right? If we, tomorrow there's electric vehicles everywhere, you know, we're, we, we have all these different energy efficient solutions we're not going to reach the targets that these companies and the and, and our our world has set 
in order to remain be remain below the 1.5 degrees Celsius target that the UN and uh, Circular Action Program Planning uh, Committee has set. Right. So these are this is you know, there's like literally a countdown clock in New York in time. I think it was in Times Square that is saying like we need to be doing something about climate change right now. But the reality is, if you just stick to energy energy efficiency, you won't actually uh, realize the potential of or, or or hit those targets. So we need to think about cl closing material loops. We need to think about localizing sharing, right? Connecting with people and understanding where need mapping where needs are within communities. Definitely. And then kind of as COVID or the onset of COVID has approached and there's been kind of like a societal wide reimagining of everything, have you seen a shift at all towards kind of a more circular approach to buying assets? Because uh, it seems to be a bit more resilient, you know, in the face of big global adversity. Yes, yes, we have. So, I mean, you could you can start with um, you can start with the the EU action plan. And now what Biden is saying with his Build Back Better program and how organizations are talking about this. Um, so to give you a little bit of, of an example, Microsoft has this billion dollar climate innovation fund, right? They're, they're one example of an organization that's doing this. But what they're talking about is if you are in the, the position to be doing something faster to support climate change efforts, do it faster. And so like, this is one organization that's doing that. There are others that are trying to look at um, this sort of combination of technology business and kind of human centricity and actually kind of where we're like, why we're having this conversation with, with uh, Kesey and this, this kind of more of the social impact side of the circular economy. But you have to have you have to have organizations that are thinking about technology, so making their goods, their products more uniquely identifiable, right? Hey, there's an, there's an asset that, that um, can be reused and be sent into a more useful product life cycle. But even from a business perspective, you're seeing a lot of organizations that are just trying to foster an ecosystem of, of partners that are thinking about the circular economy, that are thinking about you know, how do we support these communities that need these resources? Um, and then from a human side, you know, that's kind of where Reaply fits in too, is like, we need to connect just every like workplace uh, employees to sustainability programs. Like I, we, we ran a survey, I can't remember what organization it was. And we asked them like, do you, are you familiar with your organization's surplus program? Right? So like, this is a big part of what should be a big part of sustainability. And I think it was like 80% of the respondees said, no, I, I don't know what we're doing. And it's okay, uh, why? And how do, we, how, do you, how do you like actually empower people to, to do something about that? And so I think, I think, you know, our future generations need to be thinking about this. And I think we're in a really good position now to be centered on these topics um even some of the esg like if you read a lot of like the, the esg targets and these science-based initiatives there's a lot tied to the circular economy maybe not explicitly where they're saying those words but they're talking about you know corporate resiliency and how to connect um you know within this sort of hyper local scenario um hopefully that kind of answered your, your question there and there's a lot of layers to that but i think yeah, I think organizations are starting to figure it out, mainly because they had to. <laughs> like the last year was like, uh, you know, a, a broken global supply chain can teach you and can teach procurement teams a lot. And so now they're thinking, okay, I, I need to I need to figure out what we have. Like, what where can we source since we can't source from these other um, global suppliers, or it's not efficient to do so. Yeah, for sure. When you were kind of answering the last question, I was thinking about like the future workforce. So I guess like the current students um, and as this idea kind of picks up steam and goes on to like other sectors and in industries, uh, do you think it's going to have any like massive global implications for like future, the future workforce? Oh, yeah. I mean, even just thinking about like how SDG strategies are being woven into these like business activities and objectives. So like SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, um, these are, this is 
you know, taken from the UN action plan. So they have these benchmark benchmarks and these targets to essentially align companies to these different goals, right? And so like we're firmly rooted in in like sustainable consumption and how we're thinking about, you know, making an impact through through reuse, but really businesses are just trying to set all the goals. Like they want all the goals, right? Like we we went through a year of turbulence, um, not just because of COVID, COVID, but because of um, uh, you know racial inequality and and you know these are when you think about these things, when you think about these science based, based targets, they actually do intertwine with climate justice and, and socioeconomic. And you guys probably know this better than I do. Like this this is what you guys are 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 focused on, and businesses are starting to get that. And I think it's it's important um, now that we start to leverage technology to be the change maker in that, like to actually make sure it's it's um, it, it's sticky, right? We want it to be we want it to be sticky, and we want to be able to communicate progress through technology and monitor these KPIs. So, like a future um, a future goal of ours is to make sure that organizations can report on carbon uh, and sustainability metrics to these different impact partners and saying, hey, not only did we divert X amount of waste or maybe X amount of carbon from the landfill, um, uh, you know, th these are the CO2 equivalencies of the, the waste diverted from the landfill, but these are the communities that we share those resources with. And these are the different kind of ways that, uh, that um, organizations can, can get connected to maybe an unlikely partner. Right. So there's a partnership angle as well. So I think this is a really pivotal time. And, um, you know, that's a big, big part of it for us as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, the idea is honestly, I feel like kind of groundbreaking in a way. And I'm really excited to see how it kind of changes uh, other sectors as, you know, in addition to your own. Um, OK, but kind of moving away from the circular economy. Uh, so Ripley has been it's like a newer business, I would say, kind of relative to other businesses. But um, just like a quick look at your website, you've won a lot of awards and accommodations. Um, and it seemed to be re pretty well recognized on the like on the scale that you're at. Um, what's the most inspiring feedback you've gotten so far? I mean, that is, that's tough. I mean, we, we've gotten a lot of like feedback from people that just say, oh, this is a really elegant way of doing this. We've always done this manually, right? We've always had like these listservs or these manual uh, databases or systems that we use to track resources, but still my favorite um, bit of feedback, and I th actually think this will resonate a lot with, uh, with Kesey and what you guys are all about. Um, we had this algae, back of the yards algae sciences company on our platform. And um, so back of the yards in Chicago, if you're familiar with Chicago, it's kind of this, um, you know, uh, underserved community kind of in the industrial south side um, of, of Chicago and they actually were able to take resources from the University of Chicago which is in Hyde Park and on the south side and they built their own lab from these resources and they sent me an email literally with those words Reekly helped us build an entire new lab and that like that just hit me hard. that just hit me because it was like this isn't the Feinberg School of Medicine you know they don't have this 800 million dollar endowment fund these are these are smaller companies that are trying to survive and give back to their communities and think about ways that they can um, you know build build circular systems for their own communities and so when we showed that report to you Chicago and said these resources you know the millions of dollars worth of uh, leftover resources from these these transitory these transitioning labs, right? Because labs, when they're when you move to a new experiment, you you often vacate those spaces and then they're gone. Um, they like they got it. They were like, okay, this is this is how a new like how a circular economy can redefine growth from a society from a societal perspective. And so I think that was um, that was probably the biggest like most most um, exciting bit of feedback that we've ever received or I've, I've ever received I guess yeah definitely and then kind of looking at your current clientele I know you work a lot with like companies and universities um, who is kind of taking the most advantage of the current circular economy right now in terms of like asset exchange 
Yeah. Um, so it's still universities, right? So like when I started, we had, we had Northwestern. And so my, my immediate goal was, okay, how do we turn the success of Northwestern? We got, we got published in nature. How do we get more, more uh, academic institutions on the platform? And so we're working with MIT, you know, a lot of private institutions, WashU, Yale, and they're all using it for different reasons, right? So MIT is looking at Reekly as like a way to source um, leftover uh, amplifiers and electronics and, and things to actually use in new nanotechnology, right? Which is amazing. Um, Yale, completely different use case, right? They only care about, not that's not that they only care about this, but they're interested in um, furniture reuse, right? There's all this provost furniture that just sits in stores in, in storage rooms after um, you know after students graduate or maybe there's you know there's just extra furniture and so they don't know what to do with it and a lot of times they they actually like they have to chop it up and throw it out which is crazy um, but it, it's it's all over the map right so so you've got the kind of the university surplus programs happening they're using Reefly to bring better transparency to that then you've got so we work closely with um, both federal and state governments. So we're part of this Circular Cities um, Coalition, uh, which is a, uh, a group started here in Chicago, but it's essentially um, a circular economy-based program that is looking at connecting underserved communities to um, the workplace uh, organizations. So like, you know, how uh, kind of what we were doing what I was explaining earlier with you Chicago and back of the yards on a much grander scale. Um, so there's that. And then from a federal uh, government perspective, we, we found an RFP <laughs> from the De defense logistics, uh, logistics agency. And it was literally our value prop, like line item after line item after line item. And we said, okay, let's contact them and show them what we've done. And they got back to us that day and they said, okay, this is, we're going to be doing this for the disposition uh, services group for, for the air force. And so the air force Academy start is, they're not up and running, but they're on the platform. And so we're building that technology and they have like air force bases where you can, you know, take resources out of planes, like actually like an actual physical location that you go and you pull ga gadgets and, you know, things out of components out of, um, old military equipment, which is and totally blows my mind. Um, so there's that. And then the big, I'd say the biggest change since last year, once kind of the pandemic hit was, was kind of our enterprise offering, which is way more focused on um, asset management, modernizing asset management for enterprise organizations that are trying to build traceability into their sustainability workflows. Right, so they want they want to know what resources are available within different warehouses. Um, they maybe they have these like real estate workplace divisions. We 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 did this with Google actually, where they they were paying like this is going to blow your mind, but they were paying like forty thousand dollars just to store assets because they bought too many things and they didn't know which employees needed them. So you've got one hundred ten thousand employees dispersed over the globe when someone moves or, you know, a pandemic hits and you have remote assets, they don't know where to put stuff. And so we help them kind of um, visualize where those exist with big sprawling campuses. Um, and, you know, we're, we're gonna be doing that with, with Microsoft through this climate fund. They're really focused on C&D, which is construction and demolition. So they wanna know like, okay, we're going to build this build, right? Everyone wants to build, 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 right? We're going to build this building, but we need to know the material makeup of the building. And we need to know what are, what are the leftover resources upon demolition. And so Reefly is helping support those efforts from, again, from a traceability perspective. Hey, this location has, you know, X concrete in it, or this location has an extra, um, you know, uh, uh, forklift or something that you can rent off of our platform. So yeah, that's, that's, I'd say that that kind of hits it all, but it's, it's all over the map between higher ed government and uh, enterprise. 
<laughs> I'm laughing at Shauna, just like grinning because it is, it, it is crazy to think that it started with just a single lab and Gary, our founder, taking a, just this little tiny cart and wheel it, physically wheeling it to different, different uh, research team members and saying, do you want this $3,000 antibody that I was told to throw out? Yes, I do. <laughs> I do want that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's crazy. Uh, but I think we're really looking forward to the time where this becomes a public facing site. And I don't like, I know this is kind of, again, we're, we're doing this for businesses, but how do we do this for communities and for people? And that's what I'm really excited about with the circular cities kind of coalition and thinking about how, how just everyday people can access this platform. Yeah, it's kind of like a side question, just uh, hearing you talk about all that. Like, that's just so impressive. Um, I'm kind of blown away. And I feel like even since we last talked uh, a year and a half ago, I feel like yeah. you've grown so much, like, in kind of what you do and, like, the diversity of it. Um, like, is that true? Like, have you grown a lot in the past year and a half or two years? Or am I Yeah, just... no. So so when I joined the Report four of us, right, so it was all the co-founders, and then I, they, they call me the dad. I'm the only dad on the team. So, like, then the dad joined. And that was, um, that was 2018 when I joined. So we spent two years developing this product, which will tell you a lot. Um, so we, even though we were founded in 2015, our first client was 27, half of the, the second half of 2017. Um, and now we're up to 27 people from 2018. So there's 27 of us, so we're growing. Um, we're diversifying our, our team as well, which is amazing. So like, we have a product manager. Um, she she actually was, frankly, she was doing what we were doing in India. So like she was building this sort of manual system for, um, she, she actually has a waste management background. And now she's like, she ended up, she ended up going to MIT. She's building out these product roadmaps for us to be thinking about how organizations are connecting in this sort of like, um, uh, almost like a structured way. Like when you think of Slack and you have these different channels, we're thinking about resource management in the same way where it's like, if I'm a researcher and I only want to know like if glassware is available, I have that right. So I'm going to join the glassware channel. So it's very similar on Reaply where it's like, I get access to these different, um, you know, different boards or different uh, categories. And so she's been like this catalyst behind our, our product roadmap and prototyping. Um, for the future and then we've we've grown our engineering team we, we had our single C, uh, CTO that was focused mainly on building the back end and then we had our COO but he also was our chief product officer building the front end and that wasn't sustainable at all so we were like okay we need to hire people like quickly if we're going to be talking to like the DLA and the Air Force and so um, we hired uh, five we hired uh, five back-end engineers and two front-end engineers so they're focused intently on the product um the next hiring kind of uh focus for us is cs and marketing customer success and marketing because we want to be like we want to make sure that our product is always delighting people and people come onto the platform and they just enjoy the experience um the experience of exchanging resources in the past has been like it's been very boring. Companies have not like given it justice, right? So we're trying to gamify the experience to make it um, for people, especially for Gen Zers that are frankly more passionate about this subject than a lot of my counterparts and some of the leftover, uh, you know, executives that are talking about this but not necessarily doing anything about it. Um, so, yeah, a lot of a lot of growth and. Um, you know, I think we're, we're excited. We're excited for the next phase of Reaply, which is really going to be centered around building out this, this prototyping for our product and making sure that we're, we're actually looking at report sustainability reporting the way, you know, these organizations are, are talking about carbon, right? We want a carbon accounting. We want to be thinking about like all the, the different, uh, measuring sticks for, for ESG goals. And Reaply is doing a good job of that, but we're not we're not where we need to be just just yet. 
Yeah, for sure. Um, well, first, congratulations for Thanks. all that success and growth in the last few years. Um, and then I kind of wanted to, to touch on, because you talked about your current clientele, kind of where you're going to go next. And you, then you kind of mentioned it with the Circular Cities Initiative. Um, and I've just been thinking about that since you said it. Like, could you go into that a little, like, a little bit more in depth and kind of where like, Reap would fit into that? A absolutely. So the way the coalition kind of is working, so this is a this is a collaboration between an economic development uh, agency in Chicago called Pixera Global, and then um, Reapley, and then municipality group leaders in Chicago. And then we're working with the city of San Francisco and Austin and uh, city of Austin to think of circular program management uh, as a policy lever uh, within city. So to give you an example, today uh, in Illinois, if I am a city worker and I want to share a resource that I no longer need, it has to pass public resolution if it's owned by the state. That's very similar in most states, I, I, except for California, I think. And so it's actually, it's less expensive to throw out and it makes more sense from a um, from a, a books and accounting perspective to do that. And it makes more sense to do that because it's just annoying to have to like email a bunch of people to see if they want something that you, you, you perceive as not having value, even though we know that's not true, right? And so the Circular Cities Coalition is, is equal parts policy um, enablement, but it's also getting the right organizations involved to go to these leaders and say, okay, new, new change, new federal government initiative. This is the initiative. Hey, we've done this for these organizations. We've done this for the leading uh, universities, research institutions in the world. Our technology is ready to go. Do you want this? And so they can come back and say, that's too hard or no, this, 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 this in line with our policy So it's all what's really exciting is we have the sign off for Chicago go forward with this. Now it's a matter of building out the necessary workflows so that administrators within all these different county groups can can connect to each other and understand the material flows within those different counties. So it's it's not we've done the legwork right to get there and to have a use case in three cities. Um, but we're, we're still not there from like a, config, uh, a product configuration standpoint. To, I don't want to get like too technical on all this, but essentially we're not there to, to start like tomorrow. We need, we need to build this out. And so um, we partnered with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, who is they're the foremost thought leaders in the circular economy. Like, you know, I always laugh because I'm like, one of my goals from a marketing perspective was to let's latch on to all things circular economy. And it's just like, that is a holy grail because it's like, well, you're never going to beat the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, but you can try. Um, and, and so like, you know, they're going to help us build out the, the messaging, right? How do we go to these, how do we go to these change makers and say, okay, Reapley and Pixera Global and these other economic uh, development agencies, World Business Chicago is involved in this as well. We're, they're doing this and they're trying to connect these these organizations in underserved communities, but we need to replicate that for these other cities and here's why. And so that's where we need an almost an all hands on deck scenario where we tell as many different organizations about this as possible and build out our, our partner alliance uh, alliances alongside of the reference. That's the circular city. I will, I'll share, um, if you're interested in learning more about this, um, I'll share a webinar that we did uh, with GreenBiz. So many of you are probably familiar with GreenBiz Group. They run the GreenBiz 21, which is coming up, I actually think in two weeks, two and a half weeks. Um, they run Circularity, which is a huge North American circular economy conference. Um, and so all of it, so we, we actually had a, uh, our founder had a webinar on this topic. And so we can, I'll share that with you if you wanna do it a deeper dive because I do think that is a um, there are going to be jobs created from this like the, there there's going to like the circular economy we know is a it's it's a four point four point five trillion economic movement according to the 
Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which is an enormous number. Um, but I think like we need to be able to be to to talk to city leaders to actually see that through. Um, and so you know there's a lot of really good video out there on on the topic uh, that we can we can I could guide you to after this. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I would love if you uh, want to go ahead and share that. I'm sure uh, we all have, have interest in kind of learning more about it. Um, awesome. Yeah. Okay. So I don't have, I only have one more question left. Uh, it's kind of broad. And after that, I think we're going to open it up for a Q&A from everyone. Um, but yeah, so what's next for, for Reapley this year? Uh, any new big initiatives or kind of goals or challenges you're hoping to face in 2021? Yes. Um, the, the biggest thing, so we just went through our uh, Series A round. So we're going to announce that. And with that, there's a lot of partnership alliances that kind of play right into that. So it's getting, for me, my, my focus is on, on that. The second is actually one that I think will, will definitely resonate with you guys. We're building out a brand uh, narrative release. So it's a brand book that we worked on and it's going to be centered around um, human centricity in the circular economy and connecting people. And because we've always talked about, like if you look at Reefly.com now and you and you look at our promotional video, it's um, it's asset driven, right? We're talking about saving resources. Uh, we're talking about like, we've got these happy and sad little, little resources that just kind of float around. Um, we're, we're shifting our focus to be more centered on people and how to, different organizations break down these, these silos, especially in a remote world, to connect colleagues to each other in under the um, umbrella of resources. And so that brand book and, and brand narrative will, will be coming out on Earth Day as part of an Earth Day initiative um, that we're going to be working with Circular Supply Chain Network and some other, um, like Ellen MacArthur Foundation and some other thought leaders that will be participating in that release um, and then, so that's kind of where my, my head is focused on from more of a marketing perspective, but then just from a business perspective, we're, we're going to be focused really intently on building our, um, uh, I mentioned carbon offsets and, and carbon credits and things. We're going to be building that side of the product to align with, um, the Microsoft kind of goal of creating, um, a system where we're not only tracking waste diversion by weight, right? I, I reuse one item, so thus I, I took X amount of uh, weight out of the landfill, but they wanna know the, the carbon equivalency of that. And so we're gonna be building a calculator through the help of this, this um, organization, uh, large C&D organization called Skanska uh, in Seattle, which is a big um, Microsoft um, con construction supplier, like they supply all the the uh, R and D projects and, and things for their for their vendors and for for Microsoft actually, um, and so that calculator that product productization side is going to be gigantic and building out um, this new payments model. So we'll have like a Stripe integration on Reaply where you can just go in and transfer um, funds by either by grant or by cost center. So like if you're in an organization and you, you want to share something, but you don't want to exchange funds, you can ex you can exchange uh, grant, grant dollars, which is really cool. So there's a lot of fun product um, product updates, but it's, I'm tired. <laughs> I, need a, I need a vacation. Uh, it's been, you know, January was, was kind of like our breath moment. And now, um, you know, we're, we're fully like diving into this, this uh, quarterly goal. Uh, set for that we have so but it's fun it's it's impactful work and I think uh, you know I think it definitely aligns with what your passions and interests are in terms of like how do you bring this back to the community how do you talk about sustainability in a way that actually like resonates with communities um, so uh, definitely we can go to the Q&A portion if you guys have questions for me um, if I didn't maybe explain things clearly, because it's it is a complex, really complex topic, um, at least the circular like the the layers of the circular economy, it, it can be complex and hard to scale. So, 
Yeah. Uh, before we get to the QA, I just want to say it's really uh, impressive how you guys have grown on your kind of sustainability goals and projects. You've kind of started working with local governments uh, as well as private companies, universities still. Um, the growth is, is really cool and you seem to be working incredibly hard. So I hope you're uh, taking time for yourself and going to get that vacation. You, um, you sound like our HR uh, <laughs> who gets on us all the time. Like you, you need to take a break. Yeah, no, I, pre I, I appreciate that. And it's been, it's been rewarding work. Um, I think now it's just getting, it's weird when, when you're a startup, you, a lot of times you're told like you're doing this you're doing awesome you're doing great you're doing you're doing all these cool things and but the reality is like even though we're, we've gone through the series a like we're still like 60 percent likely to fail so like it's it we could fail like there's there's still that possibility our product is good um i think it needs to be better to meet some of these uh circular system goals that organizations talk about they have these 2050 sustainability plans and it's like okay, first of all, that's ridiculous. Why do you have a 2050 sustainability plan? But, um, you know, I think we need to be, uh, this, this raise will give us time to sit down and think about, okay, how do we improve our product to support all the things that we've, we've been talking about that we want to do? And that's kind of like go time, essentially. Um, but no, I appreciate you saying that. Yeah, for sure. All right. Um, if anybody has any questions for Thomas, uh, yeah, floor is yours. I can go. I haven't done it on a lot of things. So um, <laughs> I'm a marketing kid going into work for a supply chain area oh. of Target. So this is like right up my alley, basically. But I had a question about um, like, is it necessary or worthwhile to pressure companies into like starting to care about things like the circular economy or traceability? Because I've seen a lot of people try and then a company will do something kind of on the surface or shallow, but if they don't actually believe in and care about it, it won't be a system that will last. So is it worth pressuring companies into doing that? And if so, how can we do that? Um, I think you remove pressure from the equation. And I think you focus instead on uh, economic development and future future focus when it comes to systems change, right? So like all businesses want to be lean right now, right? Even like consumer electronics is a great example because we're moving, we have moved to 5G technology. So like, does it make a lot of sense to be um, buying new uh, new parts and components and commodities for the 5G world? No, it's really expensive to do that. It actually makes way more fiscal sense, uh, financial sense to to reuse these resources as best as you can. And so like that, that's a big, big component of it as well. But in terms of just like if we're just talking sustainability, sustainability has to be a, a, a lever. Like there is no business. I love this line. I've, Gary said it and I was like, oh, my gosh, that totally resonates with with me. There's no business case for the world. Like you don't need a business case for the world. Like you, you just have it or you, or you don't, or everything goes to, I can't say that word. Everything goes down the, goes down the tube. So like you, you really need to, um, you need to approach companies that are thinking about uh, fiscal year spend and procurement cost savings. And when you do that, especially if you're thinking from a supply chain perspective, Localized sharing is really one way to do that, right? Um, cutting down global supply chain, uh, uh, single source supplying is another issue, right? We don't want we don't want to be relying on China for all of the rare earth materials. Like if we have them in the U.S., why not? Why not use them? If they're cast off resources that we need to manufacture. So I think under the umbrella of remanufacturing is another area that I would focus on if you wanted to like. Get, get these organizations thinking about sustainability is, okay, you know, what are you doing to, to think about the material loops or inputs into different, different business units, right? Um, so I do, I do think the circular economy does represent a little bit of a, of a um, uh, kind of like the last ditch effort almost of saying like, okay, you don't wanna talk about sustainability, let's talk about how you can how you can actually earn back by 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 opening up these processes to change um, that resonate that is resonating with our sales team a lot more than like 
hey, um, are you are you thinking of sustainable procurement? Are you thinking of like ESG goals and how it relates to reuse or just even reuse in general gets a lot of eye rolls because it's like, oh yeah, I know we should be doing that. Um, I, yeah, I, I, hopefully that answered your question. I, okay. I do think there's, there's like another component related to just supply chain visibility, but you know, I think I would, I'll side you about that because I can go on and on about that. <laughs> I want to, I want to let other, other people ask questions, but those are the, those are kind of the areas that I would focus on. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I feel like starting last year, there's like a shift in kind of what's feasible for like uh, college students to explore after they graduate. And so like formerly risky decisions have become a bit more kind of uh, realistic in a sense. Do you have any advice for any students who are kind of hoping to go on like a more risky career path or one that's just not as well kind of uh, kind of blazing a new trail for themselves? That's a great question. I honestly think it, it needs to be like if you're passionate about something, like I, I didn't know what exactly what I wanted to do, but I knew I loved life science and I knew I wanted to be immersed in it somehow. I landed at, at Reapley because I, I was, I kept my eyes open and I, I realized a good idea when I saw it. And I, it was also somewhat serendipitous. So being open to change and, and that's a big part of it as well. Um, but I do think like, this is such a pivotal moment and there are so many, I mean, there are, there are divisions within companies being developed today, like brand new divisions and, you know, fortune 10, fortune 100 companies that are saying, okay, we're going to have an entire circular program, uh, circular economy program division. We're going to have an entire diversity and inclusion program. So like you didn't have that when, 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 I graduated it was it was like you make it's, it, it just that didn't exist so I think there's an advantage there that like yes businesses do talk a lot and they don't always you know uh, follow up on what what they're what they're saying in the media but like there are also like follow the paper trail follow where the money is going and and you can understand like there are there are investments in, in this I think the circular economy alone is seen a 10 X uh, uh, increase in investment in the last four years. Um, so I think it's, it's just knowing like what area of it can you support the most, where can you provide the most benefit? You know, I, I, I think that's a big component as well and, and being confident in, in your abilities. All right. Any more questions? I have one. Hi, Tom. Hi. <laughs> Tom, so a lot of our students, you know, they graduate and they have a job maybe already lined up after their junior year. Um, and so could you talk about your whole career path of, you know, when you were an undergrad and what advice would you give to our students about just the whole career path? You kind of talked about how there's this new area, but you're not where you thought you would be 10 years ago, right? Um, and could you maybe share, I think a lot of what we get out of this is how paths are created and where they go. And you might've thought this- That's such a that. perfect segue into Reefly too. Like, <laughs> yeah. Path of reuse. No, I, that's, it's so true. Like I, I went, I went to IU, I was, I'm an IU graduate. I, I'm a Hoosier for life. Gary, uh, our founder is a Hoosier. Uh, Tyler, a lot of people don't know, but Tyler Skelton is uh, our, C, our um, other co-founder graduated from IU as well. So this is me wanting to go to the alumni uh, uh, association after this call and saying, hey, let's talk. Um, but honestly, when I, when I went to, to Indy, um, I, took a, I took one course. Uh, it was a science uh, journalism course and I was blown away by it. I was like, oh my gosh, I, I wanna do this. I wanna get involved in, uh, I love life science and I loved how biological systems you know, work and I wanted to get involved in that. And it led me frankly into like, even a pre-med track. Like I want to take organic chemistry. I want to learn it all. Give it, give me all of it. Um, and I landed this, this role at this, I mentioned CG life at the top of this, this call. Um, I landed this role as just a, as a content marketer for them. And I got to be talking about, you know, genomic sequencing for the, you know, for, for 
these uh, diagnostic companies and things that, that are boring to a lot of people, but I loved it. And I was just like, oh, I want to get immersed in this. And so IU, even though it was one course, and it, frankly, it was the, my last year at IU, it made such an impact on me that it, it completely changed the course of history for me in terms of like people I met, that's a big part of it, but also like, you know, um, like a steady awareness of like, of science, of, of science-based um, kind of thinking and scientific method and the scientific, scientific method, which, um, you know, frankly, I, I've learned a lot too from, from my colleagues about, about that and from the people that I've worked with along the way. And um, so I, I, I really think that, and Shauna has told me this in the past, but like a lot of that is like prepared, you know, prepared me in some way for, for this challenge. And so I, I guess the moral of the story is it doesn't matter. Like when I, when I went to IU, I went there because I loved the, the business school. I loved the, the community. I loved the campus. There were, there were more than, there was more than one reason why I liked it. Right. And it, yet it just took that, that sort of that one course to say, okay, this is the direction I need. I, you know, I'll, I'll kind of land on my feet in some way. Um, but I, at least I have the, the, uh, the, the foundation almost. Um, so I think that, yeah, the, the takeaway is um, if you're passionate about like a, a approach to something or maybe something about your personality or something about what your life experience that you think fits into these different um, kind of uh, uh, buckets, different change, change, change making avenues, do it. Just jump right in and, and see it through. And if it if you fail try to fail fast, taking a Mr. Will Smith for a ride here, but try to fail fast and then try something else um, related to that, that passion. Because, you know, that's, I think that's a big, big part of it as well. I mean, Gary's a perfect example. Gary was a, he spent eight years trying to, uh, and he successfully, um, you know, created a, a drug for Parkinson's disease, right? But he was supposed to be, he was working at Eli Lilly. He had this, he had this um, career path laid out for him. And he stopped all that. He, he was doing really well. He said, no, this is just because of this one experience of wheeling around this cart and seeing and knowing the impact it made. I'm going to say goodbye to literally 10 years of school and use that as it's not even saying goodbye. It's using that as the foundation of what's next. And I think that as long as you guys are thinking about that, you're, you're square, you're, you're good to go. Um, but yeah, you, you can't, you can't use like a, uh, a degree as like the, the basis of a job. Like it, it can't, you cannot be thinking in those terms. And I, I think luckily I, I realized that, um, I didn't know that going in. I realized that on my way out of school. So all right, so I think we just have a few more minutes. So uh, just one last quick question. Um, for any students who are like wanting to follow up after this or just want to know more about Replay, what's the best way for them to do that? Yes, so I'll, I'll give you my, I mean, uh, you know, you can, you can get my email after this. I'll just send it to, to you guys. But um, if you wanted to just learn more about like what we're doing, um, there's uh, an, a contact page uh, on our website, so you can go to replay.com and then go to the contact page. Um, we also have a number, we have a newsletter. So if you wanted to like see what, what's, what's happening in the coming, uh, coming weeks, we have a newsletter there. Um, but honestly, um, it's, a, it's an open door policy for IU, uh, for me, because it's, that's, that's my, uh, that's my alma mater and anyone can reach out to me at any point. So. And thank awesome. you. Yeah, thank you for sharing. We just wanted to say thank you, Thomas, for sharing your insights. And thank uh, you, Adam. Uh, <laughs> oh, go yes, ahead, go ahead. You, no, no, I was just going to say I, I, uh, I love everything you guys are doing. And definitely keep sending me all the great work. And Shauna sent me a video last night, actually. And I was just like, oh, I can't. This is so cool. Um, but I really appreciate you guys taking time to, to learn about what we're doing. It's awesome. Yeah, we appreciate you being here with us and taking the time out um, just to have a conversation with us. If there's any follow-up questions or any comments that you all have, uh, feel free to uh, email the Kesey office, and we thank you again, and we hope to see you at our next Conversations with Kesey. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Enjoy the weekend.